ruined a real Picasso! <laughs> well, dear internet! Art, 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 art 101 with Mr. Burger. <laughs> to another episode of Art 101 with me, Mr. Berger. I'm a professional artist, master educator, who's going to attempt to provide you with the best in art historical content. If you like this video, highly recommend, highly encourage, highly appreciate any interactions that you might have with the video. Thank you in advance, and thank you to my current subscribers and likers. Thanks. <laughs> Can I join your group? Nah, piss off. So scholars, today we're going to dive a little bit more deeply into Pablo Picasso. As you know, you clicked on the video. But we're going to talk about the women in his life, the muses, the women that supported him, and quite frankly, the women that he had a, a pull on, he had his hooks into, so to speak. And, you know, it might always seem like Picasso was this really great person, but in fact he wasn't. And today we're going to dive a little bit more deeply into the real life background of Picasso and his muses. As a basic rule, creativity was really sparked within Pablo Picasso with the introduction of new women into his life. As we examine his work year after year, decade after decade, the peaks and the valleys the roller coaster of his work is really constructed by the women and the muses that would really power his artistic machine forward. He both saw these muses as revered, and they also became the targets of his abusive behavior. Now, typically he would have romantic relationships with several of these women simultaneously. He was only married twice, but had gobs of mistresses, love interests, flirtations, models, and other females that would become muses to his artistic works of art. Now, we're not going to cover every single woman that's ever been in his life, every single woman that's been a subject of his works of art, but I will do my best to make sure that we cover all of the major muses, and we're going to work in chronological order. God, you're sick. Now, one of the first muses really to grace the canvas of Pablo Picasso was actually his best friend's girlfriend. Charles Casamillos was living with Picasso in 1900. Sadly, he would take his own life in February of 1901. Now, Casamillos' girlfriend, Germain Pitot, was a model to both of these artists, and three months after her boyfriend's suicide, she would be in a relationship with Picasso. This was a fleeting relationship, but the first of many, many to come. I don't remember. Another model that we'd become involved in a relationship was Madeline. We aren't really sure what her last name was, but in the summer of 1904, she started working as a model and soon became a mistress of Picasso. At this time, he was also influenced by his time hanging out with the members of the Medrano Circus in the area around Montmartre, just outside of Paris. According to the story told by Picasso, they became pregnant and she had an abortion. There really is no other information that we know of her, even if Madeline's actually her name, we really don't know. But this relationship did greatly affect Picasso. He began drawing images of her and there are many works that have her image in it, particularly in his blue period. How lewd. Most would agree that Picasso's first true love, I guess, would have been Ferdinand Oliver. The two met in the fall of 1904. She was a French artist and model who was very much an inspiration for Picasso's Rose period, as well as his early Cubist paintings and sculptures. Now, during this time, he would keep her somewhat captive in an opium-infused prison. They would have a pretty rocky relationship that would last for about seven years, ending in 1911. Over the course of that time, she would be represented in about 60-some works of art. Now, the two would take a vacation in the summer of 1906 that would very much have an influence on Picasso and his work, especially the works that focused on the women in his life. So, they would head out to Castilla, nestled in a mountainous region in southeastern Spain. 
It was there that he first saw the painting The Turkish Bath, created by Jean Auguste Dominique Ang, and it was one of the first times that this painting was on display because many felt that it was too scandalous to show prior to that time. When he saw the work, he was amazed, he was influenced, and he was motivated to make work that created the same effects that he felt within himself when he looked at this great painting. But he also thought about getting back to the basics of creating art, allowing himself to become clumsy, allowing himself to be imperfect, and he set to work in doing the research and the planning to create this ideal work a work that would become more expressionist than observational. He would study for nine months, creating over 800 studies for a brothel scene that again was influenced by Aang, primitive Spanish art, the arts of Africa, and Iberian statues that he had seen in the Louvre, a work that he would call the Brothel at Avignon, and would eventually become renamed to his displeasure to Les Demoiselles d'Avignon, or the Girls of Avignon. The influence that the arts of Africa had on Picasso is somewhat debatable, but in the words of Picasso, he is quoted to have said, When I discovered Egyptian sculpture, I knew that that was what I would have wanted to do, but I could never have hoped to do it that well, so I gave up on the idea. But clearly, he would use these influences to his own artistic benefit. In the 1930s, she started to release various stories that she had written about their time together, and Picasso would pay her off to not release any more of these until after they had both died. The complete text, Loving Picasso, a private journal of Ferdinand Oliver, was published in 1988. She saw him as a workaholic, impulsive buyer, and a jealous lover. And like so many others, she was dumped for another girl. Tell the Sultan I'm here. That woman was Ava Gruel, but maybe more identifiable as Ma Jolie. Now because he was still with Ferdinand Oliver at the time of their meeting, he had to keep this romance a bit of a secret. So, instead of using her name or likeness directly, he had to use Ma Jolie as a symbol for his secret lover. And to top it all off, Ava and Ferdinand were actually good friends, so that was a bit problematic for him. Once the romance was discovered, the two had to flee and they would find refuge in the studio of Picasso's good friend and the artist and true developer of Cubism, George Brock. By 1914, she had contracted tuberculosis and died the following year. Well, I think you should be sorry, for Christ's sake! Slightly before and after the death of Ava, he needed to get his mind off of things, so there were several other women in and out of his life. But in February of 1917, he would head off to Rome. He was hired as the costume and set designer for the Russian ballet that was in residence in Rome, and the 36-year-old Picasso was ready to work. It was there that he would meet Olga Koklava, a 26-year-old ballerina, and the two mutually fell for one another. He would follow her on her tour of Italy and they would return to Paris and eventually get married on July the 12th, 1918. They would live for a short time in Barcelona but eventually find residence in France. On February the 4th, 1921, their first child, Paula, was born. During Olga's pregnancy, he was very much making works that revolved around motherhood and that sort of thing. And he was very much trying to be a fatherly figure and saw the beauty of the pregnancy and, and was very much motivated by that. But following the birth of Paulo, he would return to his womanizing ways. Olga would discover that he was seeing multiple women and she would file for divorce. However, Picasso was a Spanish citizen, and according to Spanish law, he was not allowed to be granted a divorce. And beyond that, he wanted no part in dividing his assets with her or anything else. So, the two would actually remain married until her death in 1955. I know what you think. <laughs> At your age? One of the women that Picasso was running around with on Olga was Marie Therese Walter. Now at the age of 45, Picasso spotted the young girl, only 17 years old, on January the 8th, 1927, walking into a Paris department store, and he sat outside waiting for her to come out. When she finally did, he broke the ice by asking if he could paint her portrait. Now she didn't have any idea that he was famous. 
As a matter of fact, he had to walk her into a bookstore where he could show her some books that had reproductions of his artwork to prove that he was as famous as he claimed that he was. Again, she was only a kid, 17 years old, but he saw her as this blonde beauty with an athletic build, but again, she was still living with her parents, so she would sneak out and even invent a fictitious job just so she had an excuse to leave to meet with Picasso. Soon he would make arrangements so she would have an apartment very close to him so he would have quick and easy access to her at all times. He began by incorporating their initials into his etchings, but by 1930 he was creating these very profound portraits of her, many of which had gestures of eroticism embedded in them like this one, which has a section of her face which is very phallic in nature. Being so young and really having access to his wealth, she became very financially dependent on him for the rest of her life. As a matter of fact, after his death, she was so severely dependent on him that just four years after his passing, she would unfortunately result to suicide on October the 20th, 1977. If you or anyone you know is experiencing troubles like this, please contact the Suicide Prevention Hotline. Now, Picasso and Walter had an eight-year affair before it was finally discovered by Picasso's wife, Olga, and this led to the spiraling of their separation, but Marie-Therese Walter was very much his muse and the mother of his first daughter, Maya, who was born in 1935, but... Within a year, and after having a child, Walter wasn't quite as exciting to Picasso as she once was. And although he would continue to paint her portrait until about 1944, she was very much passed over for a new lady friend in Picasso's life. Hold it, hold it, what the hell is that shit? Picasso's weeping woman, Dormar, was a French Yugoslav surrealist photographer, painter, poet, and political activist who met Picasso in 1935 and was his muse for some seven years. In the beginning, she challenged him and he respected her intellect and her drive and her ability to defend herself to some degree, but that quickly soured on the self-centered nature of Picasso. Picasso would say, for me, there are only two types of women, goddesses and doormats. At this point in time, the closest thing to a goddess was probably Walter. However, if there was a doormat, it would have been Dora Mar. For instance, Picasso would famously say, there are two professions whose practitioners are never satisfied with what they do, dentists and photographers. Every dentist wants to be a doctor, and every photographer wants to be a painter, making his jabs at Dora Mar. She would photograph him famously, creating his anti-war painting Guernica. He was very much abusive to her and hit Marr and Walter against one another and the 54-year-old Picasso recalled this exchange with 28-year-old Marr and 26-year-old Walter, saying, I remember one day while I was painting Guernica, Dora Marr was with me. Marie Therese dropped in, and when she found Dora there, she grew angry and said to her, I have a child with this man. It is my place to be here with him. You can leave right now. Dora said, I have as much reason as you have to be here. I haven't bore him a child, but I don't see what difference that makes. I kept painting and they kept arguing. Finally, Marie Therese turned to me and said, Make up your mind. Which one of us goes? It was a hard decision to make. I like both for different reasons, Marie Therese because she was sweet and gentle and did whatever I wanted her to do, and Dora because she was intelligent. I decided I had no interest in making a decision. I was satisfied with things the way they were. I told them that they'd have to fight it out themselves. So they began to wrestle. It's one of my choicest memories. This relationship was full of abuse, whether it was physical, emotional, mental, jealousy, all kinds of things going on. And he would even tease her about the other relationships that he had with other women. He would use that as ammunition against her. And he would even show private erotic works that he had done of her to others despite her pleading for him not to. When all was said and done in 1943, she would be completely cast out. She would suffer a complete nervous breakdown and become a recluse. And later she would tell him, As an artist you may be extraordinary, but morally speaking you're worthless. We try and teach our children not to make fun of others. The intellectual beauty that would destroy the relationship between Picasso and Marr was Francois Gillot. 
She was a 21-year-old art student and he was a 62-year-old who happened to be in the same cafe having dinner one night in 1943. Now this was a time during the German occupation of France and so it was a very difficult time for the whole country and this may have been part of the catalyst that allowed these two to come together in some way, shape or form. At any rate, he was mesmerized by her beauty and he would lure her in with the promise of teaching her painting and things of that sort. And eventually this faux teacher-student relationship would develop into a physical relationship that would result in two children together. During the time of their relationship, his work really focused on the family, focusing on her as a flower and things of that sort, focusing on the children, the relationships with all of these different women and children and things like that was really kind of a balancing act for him that he was really trying to use as creative inspiration. Now eventually she got tired of all of the abuse and the affairs and all of that kind of thing. And she was one of the very few women that ever left Picasso, leaving him in 1953. And in 1964, she would write a book about their time together that caused him to disown her and the children. But sadly, Gilot would not be the last to suffer being a muse of Picasso. Why do you ask that? Because if we stopped there, we would be excluding Jacqueline Roque. Jacqueline was recently separated from her husband when she met Picasso. He would spend a lot of energy pursuing her and eventually the 26-year-old Jacqueline would give in to the persistent 72-year-old Picasso. And in the end, he really wanted her to sacrifice herself on the altar of his art and eventually he would convince her to do anything for the elderly artist. In 1961, six years after his first wife's death, the two were married and stayed together until Picasso's death in 1973. This was a time when his full focus and attention was on Jacqueline. There were very few guests that came to the house. He never was seeing his children or the other women or muses, so 100% of his focus and attention was exclusively on her. He would paint her more than any other muse, creating 160 paintings of her likeness and using her for over 400 works of art. After Picasso's death, she would take care of his estate, battling with Gilo and her children because they were completely cut off and because they were not allowed to attend the funeral. But eventually Roque and Gilo would make peace and they would work together to found the Musée Picasso in Paris. In 1986, she would help organize a huge Picasso exhibition in Madrid, Spain. This would be her last homage to her husband before committing suicide. If you or anyone you know is experiencing troubles like this, please contact the Suicide Prevention Hotline. Picasso once said, It is my nature to get angry, but I'm always saying things that I don't mean. When I shout at you and say disagreeable things, it's to toughen you up. I'd like you to shout and get angry. Shout and carry on. Picasso was one that really loved confrontation and conflict. Olga was ultimately rejected because she demanded too much. Marie Therese was one who never demanded anything, but was rejected because she wasn't seen as being intelligent enough. Dora Maar was very intelligent, but was ultimately rejected because he just got tired of her. And the sad fact of Picasso is, as he said, I'd rather see a woman die any day than see her with someone else. Now that was a roller coaster of a story. I appreciate you watching and following along with it. We'll see you again next time and you have a good day out there. See you next time. Get him out! Take him out!